I welcome you into this time of Advent. I welcome you into a day of celebrating hope. Listen to Isaiah chapter 9 once again. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, we're told this, Nevertheless, the gloom of a distressed land will not be like that of former times. Aren't you glad when God announces that those things that are bad and wrong will one day be reversed? Well, here we have this promise. The gloom of a distressed land will not be as it was in former times when he had to humble the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. Have you ever felt the chastening hand of God bringing humility to what would otherwise be a prideful life? This becomes the commentary of a certain time in the history of the people of God. Verse 1 seems to be a verse, a message that is filled with distress. Until you read in that incredible apex of an announcement, but in the future, He will bring honor. In the future, He will bring glory to those people who had once fell upon distressed and wearisome times. And then verse 2, as we've heard read already, gives the incredible reason why the land that was distressed can be a land of glory. Because the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. I ask you today, church, have you seen a great light? People walking in darkness, the promise reads, have seen a great light. I think at times we find it easy to bemoan the darkness, but are we celebrating that we have the light. When I ask you to go in your mind and heart with me for just a moment to how important God's story becomes as his plan is revealed. They called it Born Again Beach. Sounds like a great place for a vacation, doesn't it? Why was it called this? From a British newspaper, an Irish beach more than 30 years ago, completely disappeared at the hands of an epic storm in 1984, leaving nothing but rocks and rock pools on what was once a very beautiful coastline. But something happened in April of this past year. Around Easter of 2017, there was a very unusual tide that brought in tons of sand and recreated the once lost beach into a once again 300 meter long golden strand of coast. Actually happened. The guide of the local tourism of Doge Beach responded as to why there were so many pilgrims coming to look at this renewed, rebirthed piece of land. And I quote the guide of tourism when he says, people here are calling this miraculous. And we live in a dark time, so when people come to see the beach that has been rebirthed, it seems to give people hope. I, I suppose something as tangible as a landmass disappearing only to be brought back would give one hope, especially if the only conclusion rests with God. There's another story of similar nature that I think you're going to find very interesting today. Now this story is similar because once there is an ancient piece of land, a holy, precious piece of land, it was lost. Not to the surmounting natural tide, but to a tide of irreligious and immoral behavior among the people of God. But that does not conclude the story. For this land that was lost once to spiritual darkness had become desolate and bare, but would one day be a land, once again, of light. And so because this land became a land of light, there were people, much like those at Dove Beach, who looked at what God was doing and found great hope. 
The land referenced second is the land that is marked in Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 9, verse 1, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. These parcels of land named after tribes soon, many, many years later, to be named geographically becomes a place that was once dark and now light again. We know in Scripture that light is a great symbol of hope. So there was a land made desolate. God brought to life again, which gave his people hope. So I ask you today to join me in this brief narrative of the prophet's words to understand how hope can be measured from God's perspective. Now, these verses hold three very distinct measurements of hope. I want you to see these uh, for just a moment. The first is the story. The second is the actual hope. And the third is a person. But let's look first at the hope, the, the story. The story reads from brokenness to redemption. Now, as Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 opens, we're reading something that comes from the prophet Isaiah at the turn of the 7th century B.C. We're reading something that seems to indicate that possibly the ancient land of Judah has seen her best days. The Assyrian invasion and occupation had been an instrument God had used to bring his spiritually wayward people under his judgment and correction. Chapter 8, if you're reading the context, shows the, the dimness of what God was proclaiming through Isaiah to his people and through the region of Judea. But chapter 9, that dimness fades and we are giving a message of light. We've heard it read this way already, but there will be no more gloom for Israel who was once in anguish, for in earlier times trouble came to the land. But soon, by way of the other side of the Jordan, by way of the sea, by the Galilee of the Gentiles, there will be a light. Now consider for just a moment why there's such uh, specific attention given to geography that we see listed in, in verse 1. I love that there's something unique about these places named after tribal uh, entities, Zebulun and Naphtali, these names marked hope you'll catch this, a primary place of attack when the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser came in to, to ransack this nation. These two locations became the principal place, the primary place where the first attacks took place. With this being announced by tribal names, the attention in verse 1 then turns to names that are strictly geographical. In the future, by way of the sea to the land east of the Jordan, Galilee of the nations, north and south of Galilee, there will be a light. So what was once named as a primary place where the king of Assyria attacked, Naphtali and Zebulun, the exchange of those names became a geographical location exact by longitude and latitude, latitude where Christ Jesus set his feet and began proclaiming the gospel. The primary place of Assyrian attack became the principal place that first heard the gospel. There will be a light in the land. So with this movement from brokenness, darkness under Assyrian captivity, to redemption, the presence of Christ ministering and walking among that brokenness, there is a twofold reality of hope from the story, from the movement of brokenness to redemption. Now, the first reality is this there is no brokenness that God cannot heal. This becomes the general message of the story. There is no brokenness God cannot heal. I love the message of Romans 8 as I'm sure you do. Nothing separates us from his love. I love the message of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. The redemption that Jesus offered up will be, are you ready for this, an eternal redemption. 
So the, the general message of this announcement that darkness hit a particular land and then light came to that very same place announces that there's no brokenness that God cannot remedy or heal. But from that general announcement of the story comes a very particular uh, assertion of the story from brokenness to redemption. The exact longitude of darkness and captivity, the exact latitude marking fallenness became the exact location wherein the gospel became known, as was already said. So a second reality is this. God's healing and restoration is always a complete work. No, generally, it is, it is true. There is no brokenness God cannot heal. But particularly, particularly, His redemption has for you a plan not only of, of healing brokenness, but bringing His glory to your life. We are told in verse 1, this is an incredible announcement. In the future, the glory will fall upon this land through Christ. The, the land will be honored. The redemption will be honored by God Himself as the gospel comes. So there's no redemption. that God cannot heal. And the second reality, His redemption, His healing and restoration is always a complete work. For the exactness and the accuracy of where the brokenness took place for God's people is, is complemented by where Christ's feet first trotted with the pronouncement of the gospel. I love such verses as Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 3, which reminds us that God will, through the ultimate sacrifice, restore everything that was taken. I, I say to you today, church, we should be celebrating our redemption with the deepest measure that the scriptures can, can bear before us. That God's redemption restores everything that the enemy has taken. It's a complete work. We may not always see and understand God's movement in his time and the great mystery of God's sovereignty will always be that which presses in on us and we embrace who he is by faith to understand that his redemption is a complete work. It's a beautiful work. And so that's the story. This is the incredible synopsis God led the prophet Isaiah to announce on the forefront of this incredible passage. The synopsis of the story from brokenness to redemption. If you recall, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, we... The church, those whose faith reside in Christ, we've been given the ministry and the message of reconciliation. We have been called to mirror this story, and so our lives, our own personal stories, have become capsuled in these stories. Someone once said, Ken, share your story with me. I began sharing my testimony, and they said, no, I don't mean the story of the Bible, I mean your story. And I said, that is my story. It has now become capsuled in Christ. So the story reveals God's plan by moving his people from brokenness to redemption. So that's how we measure hope. We measure it by the story. Do you have hope yet? The story says we should. So now we measure it by something a bit more particular. The story of verse 1 now becomes more illustriously depicted in verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. So moving from the story, let's now move to the hope. So the second measure of this hope is the literal hope, the actual hope that is divinely planned and forever assured. Hope does not become, from the pages of Scripture, this desperate grasp for something good that we hope will take place. Hope is indeed divinely planned or initiated by God and forever assured. I want to show you this from this verse. We're told in verse 2, the people in that dark land will be a representation of the people who one day, and, and time here, some 700 years later, will be a people who will see the light. But they will not only see the light as in theory or from a distance or as a fading value, because Scripture says they will see the light, and those who know the light, 
their entire lives will change. Verse 4 is just one of many proofs of this. The burdensome of the yoke of slavery will actually be shattered. So seeing the light is not about knowing that there is a light as opposed to darkness. Here, seeing the light represents that the redemption of the light is fulfilled in our lives. And it's by divine intention of God's love. We are told in 1 John, as you recall, it's not that we love Him, but that He first loved us. He's the initiator. And the hope that we have is not only capsuled in the story, but we see it in the true definition of hope. God has intentionally stepped in. And God has brought a light that is not something to be observed. God has brought a light that is not ornate, but a light that brings absolute change because the Gospel of John tells us that it's the, it's the light of life. Anytime the zoe, the life, is added to an adjectival type word picture like light, the emphasis becomes that which changes one completely. So the light, the revelation of the truth of Jesus becomes life when our faith is in Him. So God intentionally brought this hope. This hope is indeed divinely planned. But secondly, it's forever assured. Most will know when reading in the Old Testament that prophecies are more than not demonstrated grammatically in the perfect tense. Do you know what the perfect tense is? Action that has been completed. But here in this verse, there are some 700 years that will span before the reality takes place uh, visually and, 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 and literally, but because God's hope is so incredibly steadfast and sure and secure and guaranteed, much like all the prophecies of the Old Testament, the declaration is, this is as good as done. So his hope is divinely intended, and certainly this hope is forever assured. In the summer of 1741, a 56-year-old composer who had been brought low by a physical stroke and also by all types of financial difficulty was at the most desperate point of his musical career. He wanted to do something different than he'd ever done before. Because of his faith in Jehovah, he sat before the Scripture open to the very place your Scripture is open today. Isaiah chapter 9. And he began to read. And he began to sense the joy of this message of hope. And he aspired to put together a piece unlike any he had ever done. 24 days later, George Frederick Handel finished his work we know as the Messiah. We all know that triumphal conclusion, do we not? But may we not miss in this most famous of his oratorio, the first movement. For in that first movement, Handel does well to capture the incredible joy of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 through 7. What is that joy? I like reading it as was emphasized in Handel's work. Instead of darkness, verse 2 says, there's a great light. Instead of fears and tears of a very small nation, verse 3 says, God has enlarged their nation instead of bondage. According to verse 4, those oppressive yokes have been broken. Instead of constant war, verse 5 declares, all those implements of war will be burned with fire. What an incredible reversal. For that becomes the definition of hope. The great reversal. For do you see how scripture, beginning with verse 2 and following, gives this beautiful picture of what was but what is to be. This absence of light and this darkness was met by the greatest light. These fears and tears of a small nation were met by the promise that enlarged their boundaries. This bondage was met by one who broke the chains and the yokes and this constant war and absence of peace was met by him who brought peace. Who is this one that would accomplish something that we could never accomplish or do for ourselves? 
For this one, this mighty warrior, has a name. Which brings to us the third and the final measure of this text to indicate that which is truly hope. The story moves us from brokenness to redemption. The hope itself shows us that God divinely initiated and forever assured this great hope. But finally, this hope announced here is measured, aren't you glad, by a person. By Christ. At the latter part of verse 2, those living in the land, they will see this light that has dawned. There's such a picturesque and poetic piece to this narrative of history that brings forth theology unlike we've, we've not seen before at this point in the book of Isaiah. A light has dawned. The perfect tense is used for a reason. God has declared it. His son is here. And what will become of the place given to the son, God in the flesh, the most high, bringing his only begotten to earth, to be born to a virgin in an obscure way? What is to become of him who is the light that has dawned? We move from verse 2 to verse 6, and we're told who he is. This hero that has come in and has brought the great reversal, taken away that which is broken, taken away and bringing that which God has intended. And we know the light because the light, the hope, is in one. His name is Jesus. Summarizing all that he is, I love how verse 6 tells us that government will rest on his shoulders. I believe perhaps this might be the most profound statement of who he is at this point in Isaiah's prophecy. Every entity known to man would be the message here. Everything that man would call authority and power and footnote in this day, people hungered for that governmental authority and power. Sure, it's not like that today, but it was then. People hungered to be a global domination and presence. And Christ quietly came in, not to battle, against those who desire global dominance and governmental presence, as if to have to win the throne as king of kings, the humble babe came in because the throne was already here. He quietly came in. and Every entity of authority rested on his shoulders. But then we're given specifics to who he is. Notice these very familiar words that ring out from verse 6. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, our wisdom and our guidance. Do you need wisdom today? Do you need guidance? Do you know people who, who are devastated because they do not live by a godly wisdom and guidance? And Jesus is our wonderful counselor. He's our mighty God. Do you need a warrior on your behalf today who can defeat death, hell, and the grave? Do we live in fear even though that we bear the same name as he who has been our mighty warrior? He's the eternal father representing his, his permanent and eternal existence in history past, in eternity past, and in future, in eternity future. He is all things. Creation completely, Colossians tells us, is summed up in the Christ. He's the eternal Father as Son, pointing all things to the Father. And he's the Prince of Peace, this powerful reference that he rules all things because of the glory bestowed upon him from the Father. So when I look at the person, these conclusions come to my mind. The light has dawned in the person of Christ. So conclusion number one, notice how each of these titles of Jesus fulfill the message of verse one and two. Each title, counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, becomes the expression of the one who has become for us all light and hope. A second conclusion, notice how these names can allow us to know him in a very personal and real way. The scripture says he, all things rest on his shoulders, but he can become for us a counselor. Do we not understand how personal that is? God reaching down, stepping into our lives through his son, that he might become our, our counselor. And at the same time, our mighty God, warrior, father, the presence of care, and then prince of peace, one who rules his kingdom. 
with ultimate and perfect success. So uh, these names fulfill verse 1 and 2, the light and the hope, but these names also show us how personally we can know Christ. But a third conclusion, these names, these names allow us to know Jesus so tangibly that all excuses of not trusting him are eradicated. All excuses of not trusting him are dismissed in these names. For what could you find in your life or I could in mine that would contend with one of these titles in such a way that we would have the right to squirm in our own doubt and frustration when we see who he is? Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So this is our hope. It's measured by the story from brokenness to redemption. This is our hope, accurately defined as literal hope, divinely planned and forever assured. This is our hope, the person, Jesus Christ. When my oldest girls were younger and now that my five-year-old is actively going places that I go. There are just those few times that while we're shopping or we're at a busy place, I might step a little bit to the right. She might step a little bit to the left where she can't see me. When I notice that she's out of my distance even slightly, there is a whistle that I will sound out that I've perfected over the years that I will definitely not practice at this point. <laughs> but that whistle is so well known by my oldest daughters and my youngest, wherever they hear it, they know to come toward that, that whistle. Uh, especially when they were younger, and especially when my five-year-old is in that place that seems to be fearful. She hears the whistle. Okay, the dad's just right there. But you know what I found interesting? They never were satisfied with the whistle. They never stopped just to say, okay, as long as I hear him whistling, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. They realized, hey, he's not close by. The whistle was not the end of the journey. The whistle was the hope that said, he's there. And so the hope of the sound of the whistle took them to their father. Hope is never meant to satisfy you without the one who gives you hope. Hope is the indication that you will be satisfied in Christ. We can't say he's my hope and not run to him. We hear the prophets whistling his name. We hear the gospel sounding him out. We know him. But if we say, as long as I know he's there, I'll go to him if I need him, does not define hope. Hope is not having him there in the event that I want to call on him. Hope is desperately running to him when I find there's been distance. Knowing that everything I need in life is in him. So we close this Opening message of Advent with a simple question. Do you really have hope in him? If someone were to take a DNA sample of your life, would that sample say spiritually, this person truly has Christ as their hope? Or, or are you just simply fond of the Father's whistle? Know the source of your hope. The story of your hope is from brokenness to redemption. The actual defining reality of your hope is that God intended it and it's forever assured. Then your hope is in the person of Jesus Christ. I pray you have hope today. I pray you celebrate that hope with the deepest of authenticity so that others will know the source of your hope. Let's stand together.